there's a part of the mind that may sometimes tell you, if only this task gets done, then I can really rest. But then how many tasks have you done and found that there are more tasks to be done? The work of the world is never done. When people retire, it's not because their work is done, it's because either they're too old and too weak to do the work, or they get pushed out. But the work is not done. The world is a work in progress, and you can't wait for the work to get done. For the mind to be able to really rest, you have to learn how to take rest in the midst of this construction site. This is why the forest ajans would often begin their meditation instructions not by going straight to the breath or straight to whatever the topic is, but to some contemplations. Contemplations of the body. Realizing that so many of the affairs of the world have to do with looking after the needs of the body. And yet, what have you got? Liver, kidneys, spleen, stomach, lungs. Nothing you would like to invite over for dinner for conversation. And yet, the needs of these things can rule so much of your life. It's good to stop and think. Can't the mind have some time for itself and not be a slave to the body? That's one contemplation. You can think about how all the affairs of the world are in constant stressful and not self. That if you try to find your real happiness there, it's going to lead to disappointment. In other words, think your way to stillness. Use these thoughts to cut through any thoughts that would send out their webs. Say, well, let me think about this and then connect this with that and that with this. Any thought that extends in any direction, just think of your mind cutting through it. There's one of the forest Hans who was an expert in making axes. He'd like to t talk about how you should think of your ha having a knife in your in your hand, and anything that makes a connection anywhere, either in the body or in the mind, just cut right through, cut right through. This requires a strong sense that your true happiness is going to be in stillness. The Buddhist principle that there is no happiness other than peace. You really have to take that to heart. When he says, see, renunciation is rest, take that to heart, too. Renunciation here is renunciation of anything that has to do with the, the five senses. And stop and think about it, all the work of the world is involved in the five senses. To put that aside, whereas when the Buddha says, subdue greed and distress with reference to the world. Use that thought, anything that's an affair of the world, gain, loss, status, loss of status, praise, criticism, pleasure and pain. You don't want them to get their vines around your mind. Try to cut through, cut through, cut through anything that would connect. Even the thoughts in the mind. And begin to send out little shoots. You're going to cut those off, too. The only thoughts you want are the ones that talk about how great it is to get the mind to be still, and how you've got this opportunity right here. You're able to breathe. You've got a mind that's aware. You know what to do. So many people, if there's Asked to just sit here and watch their breath for an hour, it would be totally at a loss. 
but you've heard the instructions many times. And you know that they're for your well-being. The ease and the sense of fullness that can come when the breath is just right. And the fact that you have only one duty right here, which is to develop the path. And although it may seem like the path has lots of factors, or eight factors, remember the concentration is the central one. Everything else is there to help prop it up so that if the mind wanders off, you can either use the right view, as when you're thinking about thoughts that remind you how you really do need to find some rest in the midst of the unfinished work of the world. Right resolve, right speech, right action. Right speech is what you're talking to yourself about right now. That's the beginning of right speech. Right action, you're not doing anything harmful. Right livelihood, you're nourishing the body with a breath. Right effort, you're trying to stick with the breath as best you can. Right mindfulness, you're with the body in and of itself, to the breath as you're experiencing it right now directly experiencing it right now. You don't have to think of anything beyond that, just the direct sensation of the breath. So all these things keep reminding you, this is where you want to be, this is where you should be. And it's a good should. In other words, one that is for your own well-being. You're being asked to exercise your freedom. And that's an opportunity that's really rare in the world. Everyone else wants to place burdens on you. The Buddha is teaching you how to take the burdens off. The problem is we've internalized so many messages from outside about how you have to be responsible for this, you have to worry about that. They're so internalized that they seem to be us as they speak in the mind. And you have to learn to see them as not self. We think about not self as a perception that comes way at the end of the path. But it's useful all the way along. After all, even before you practice, you're not selfing things. Thoughts come into the mind, you say, nope, I don't want that. You don't identify with it. It just goes away. Things outside, issues outside, there's some who say, that's not my affair, that's not my business. So the mind is already used to not selfing. It's just a question of learning how to do it skillfully. Because sometimes we not self things that we really should be responsible for. And John Suwad used to like to focus on the fact that the Buddha said there are so many things that are not self, not self. But then he says that we are the owners of our actions. This is something we are responsible for. And this is another reason why you should be focusing on getting the mind really still. His actions come out of where they come from your intentions. Your intentions come from where they come from the mind. And they come from an erratic mind. You really can't trust them. If they come from a mind that's really still, solid, secure, then you can put some more trust in your intentions, more trust in the fact that you're going to be shaping your life in a good way. So when you think rightly, everything points to getting the mind to be really still and appreciating the stillness, appreciating your opportunity to be still. Even if the mind can't settle down, it still feels antsy about this, that, or the other thing. At least remind yourself you're heading in the right direction, trying to get the mind still, seeing the value of stillness. There's so many people out there in the world who don't see the value of this at all. But you've learned that this is worthwhile. There's that Stephen Colbert question, Buddhism, huh? 
You wrap yourself up in a cloth, go sit under a tree, and you breathe? Well, yes. And you'd be amazed at how many good things you can find in the mind if you just sit here and breathe. Watch the breath. Watch the mind. Try to keep the two together. Adjust the mind so it's happy to be with the breath. Adjust the breath so it's a good place to be for the mind. And then hover around the two of them as they stay together. Let them have their peace. Let them have their quiet. Let them have their quiet. Because a lot of really good things come out of the quiet mind. We not only have a pleasant abiding in the present moment, but it provides a good foundation for greater mindfulness and alertness. When the mind is quiet, you see things more clearly. You have your wits about yourself. One of the functions of mindfulness is to recognize when something unskillful has come up in the mind. and You want to nip it in the bud as fast as you can. Well, the more quiet you are, the more likely you'll see it. It's like raking the sand out here on the pad every day. The fact that we rake it every day allows us to see what animals have come through. So sweep the mind. So any little footprints of any thoughts will show up immediately. At the same time, I Still, a quiet mind provides a basis for you to look at the thoughts that come up and see why it is you go for them, even though part of you knows that they're unskillful. Why is there another part that wants them? And because you're staying quiet, you're not following them. You get to see them for what they are. You can hold them in check and examine them. So this is a good place to be, not only for the sense of well-being that it gives you while you're right here, but it provides a foundation for more mindfulness, more alertness, more discernment, the kind of discernment that really can make you free, even from the need to do concentration, ultimately. But in the meantime, see your concentration, this opportunity to sit here with your mind quiet, as an exercise in freedom. Freeing, your, freeing yourself from all the burdens of the world, and all the thoughts inside that would make you a slave to the world. And learn to fully appreciate how good it is to be here, fully present, your awareness filling the body, the breath filling the body, sense of ease filling the body. knowing that it feels good and it's good for you.